Okay, so good. Welcome everyone to uh, Sunday Poetry of Enlightenment. Today, we're going to be talking about Allen Ginsberg. Oh boy. Um, Ginsberg, by the way, is the uh, is the only one of these poets that we've dealt with so far uh, that I've I actually met a couple of times. Um, he he first came to uh, I first met him at San Francisco State College where I was a student around. Uh, he came around 1967, and I'll show you. This is this is what he looked like at the time, something like this. Okay, and uh, everyone seeing that? Yep. Okay, and uh, you notice he's playing a harmonium that he picked up in India. It's a little little keyboard instrument. You pump it with one hand. It's a little hand pumped squeeze organ uh which is used a lot in chanting mantras that's the first time i ever saw a harmonium and he read some poetry and he chanted uh uh hari krishna and played the harmonium little did i know that that years later i would also be playing the harmonium <laughs> and uh met him a, a couple other times in new york city and in in uh, decades later and um one time, he actually came to the, the school where I was teaching in uh, uh, New Jersey, the Pingree School, and um, to do a, a reading. And I was assigned to sort of be his host. We had a, a dinner in the cafeteria. And he bef before he g he'd give a reading anywhere from long experience, I'm sure he would send you a list of instructions for how he wanted things set up you know, the lectern like this, the mic here, um, um, and, and a thermos of herb tea. So we were in the cafeteria at the dinner beforehand, and I asked him, uh, uh, I, I was going to go fill his, the, the carafe with tea for him and the, the thermos, and I asked him if he wanted honey. He said, uh, no thanks, I'm, a, I'm diabetic. And I said, well, are, do you know about the reflexology points on your feet that are supposed to help that? And he said, no, show me, and immediately stripped off his shoes and socks. And, and I sat there because I was, at the time, I was moonlighting as a, as a uh, uh, reflexologist. And I sat there. I got, oh, this is cool. I've got America's arguably most famous poet. I'm holding his, his feet in my hands here. And <laughs> so, so that was fun. Um, actually, um, did you cure him of his diabetes? Yeah, really. Uh, I, 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 I don't, not that I know of, uh, <laughs> let me put it that way. Now also, um, uh, Sub, you have a, you have a story, a Ginsburg story, I believe to share. Sub? Yeah, I, I was muted. Yeah, uh, yeah, I, I do. As a matter of fact, it really parallels yours in uh -huh. many ways. Uh -huh. uh, I was living down in the East Village with a college roommate on East East Tenth Street, just off Tompkins Square Park. Mm -hmm. uh, and there was a bookstore that was almost directly across the street on the other side of Tenth Street, and it was the Peace Eye Bookstore, mm -hmm. and it was at as a, it was a bookstore, but it was also kind of a beat poet hangout place occasionally. And so you'd see some of the famous beat guys from New York who lived in the village going in and out. I had somehow come across a copy of the Bhagavad Gita uh, mm. that, you know, the Theosophical Society, the old, you know, Annie Besant and those guys. Right. And, either in there or some somehow related to that, I had heard that in order to get really get next to this yoga Indian spirituality thing, which was just on fire on the mm -hmm. West Coast and the East Coast, mm -hmm. uh, you had to have a guru. Mm -hmm. 
And Alan, as he had been out here in San Francisco, Dean, was mm -hmm. leading ohm chanting in Tompkins Square Park that summer. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking this is the summer. It must have been the summer of maybe 66, late spring or early summer. Right. And because it was a very warm night mm -hmm. and we had the windows open in the front of the house. It looked out over 10th Street. And I looked over and there was Alan going into the PSI bookstore. Mm -hmm. So I yelled out, hey, Alan, hold up. I slipped into my sandals, ran downstairs. We were on the second floor mm -hmm. and across the street. And I said, listen, Alan, I've, uh, I mean, he didn't know me from anybody. Right. <laughs> right. Very familiar. But I said, Alan, listen, I understand you've got to have, I've been, I've been reading the Bhagavad Gita. I'd also been chanting Hare Krishna around the corner Mm -hmm. at Swami Bhaktivedanta's first little storefront on 2nd Avenue. Anyway, right. that's a whole right. other thing. Right, and, and by the way, around that time, I was chanting in his second storefront temple, which was on Frederick Street in San Francisco. Now, I knew that, but I, wasn't, I wanted you to tell that, because okay. I know that about you. Okay. <laughs> so I'm telling you, there was real parallels here, Dean. Yes. The fact that we're together today is no yeah. accident. Yeah. <laughs> so I have a little story. Wait, wait, wait. I want to hear wait. the rest of Sue's story. Oh, Sue. Oh, oh, okay, so, so I go running down the street. I tell him to hold up. And I, I say, Alan, listen, I've, I've been reading Bhagavad Gita. And apparently, you have to have a guru. You've been there. You've been to India. I, I assumed he'd been to India. I didn't know that for a fact. Right. You've been there. And you've been chanting Om. Said, and I said, would you be my guru? <laughs> right. <laughs> I'm maybe it, 20 years old, 21, somewhere in there. Right. And, uh, and at that time, says, it was obvious anyone who had been to India what must be enlightened and was qualified to be your guru. <laughs> They, the, they've been to the Holy the, Land. Those they were the, a hell those of were a lot the, more than I did. The good old days, yeah. I'm not even sure I understood what a guru was, to be honest. Right, right. But you needed one. Right. <laughs> so, so I said, Alan, you know, I've been reading this Bhagavad Gita, you know, and I understand you need to have a guru. Would you be my guru? And he smiled. It was very, very sweet. And he said, no, man, listen, you know, I'm, I'm still trying to get next to this myself, you know, so I'm, I'm not the guy. Mm. But... Uh, Conrad Rooks, who was a, uh, uh, an independent filmmaker, he said, mm. listen, uh, Conrad is bringing over the real deal in the fall. So I, that was probably the summer of 66 then. In the fall of 67, the Conrad Rooks had met this guy in India who was a real yoga master. Mm -hmm. And he, when he comes over, connect with him because he's a real Swami master guy. Mm -hmm. So that was it. So fast forward, it's well into the fall of 67. Uh, I had a, a, a buddy named Lenny, whose last name I'll leave unspoken, who was a small time dope dealer, mm -hmm. uh, mostly ma marijuana, you know, hashish, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And so I was uptown, we were going to make this connection, he was going to do this we deal mm -hmm. and it didn't come to pass meanwhile swami had arrived and i'd seen posters around the village and other places that he had a a a um uh, an open house on wednesday evenings and so it was wednesday evening and here i am uptown on the west side so i said to my buddy lenny hey listen that swami that alan told me about he's you know he's up on 80 86th street west end avenue somewhere in there and I said, why don't we, let's go on up and check him out. And Lenny said, no, man, listen, I'm going on back down to the village, but you go ahead, you know, I'll catch up with you later. So I went up to 500 West End Avenue, up second, third floor, a bunch of folks sitting in there. And that's how I met my teacher. Right. It was right. So Swami Sachi Dananda. Right. Yeah. Nice. Right. right. But, so, that's, but, so that's my, that, that's my connection with uh, basically by, knowing that he was doing ohm chanting, <laughs> you know. <laughs> right, right. And, and, and by the way, I, I, I got us, I always felt, I never had the privilege of meeting Swami Satya Dananda, but actually you all can see him. If, if you've ever seen the film Woodstock, he's there at the beginning, he gave the benediction at the beginning of mm. Woodstock. And I got to say, if nothing else, he, he was the best looking guru. 
on the circuit. He was, his beard, his hair, they were just fabulous. Yes, he, 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 he certainly looked the part. Yeah, he did. He did. I realize there's someone ahead of me with a story, and I promise to keep mine to 60 seconds or less when it's my turn. Cause okay, to Tova, getting... take it away, Tova. Me, Kathy. Mine is 20 seconds. Okay. So um, he, he had a cousin at Carnegie Mellon University in my husband's uh, department, mm -hmm. and so he was invited to give a, a reading to which I went, and the, the interesting uh, part of my story is that the entire time that he uh, read his poetry, he was drumming. <laughs> right. Mm. He was drumming the whole time. Right. But that's all I have to say. <laughs> okay. Okay. Good. Kathy. Then we got Scott's story, and then we yes. got well, then we got Kathy's story. Okay. Thank you. All right. I went to uh, one of his uh, readings at uh, Shelter Island in, um, I think it's called in Long Beach. Walked in, no one was there. He was the only person there, sitting there alone. Uh -huh. This is about a year before he died, two years before he died. And I went up to him and he wasn't the warmest guy. <laughs> went up and I said, I got a question for you. I've looked at your photos and things and I notice you surrounded always by such interesting people. I find such superficial people all around. I don't seem to be able to connect, you know, and first he gave me a little advice about, well, where are you going and who are, you know, go to people with common interests, blah, blah. And then he said, have a seat here. I mean, here, talk about you were holding his feet. I was a one-on-one -on -one interview with the guy, right? Great. And he looked at me and, you know, kind of took a pause, looked right at me and he said, you know what, if you look, you'll find a little bit of the Buddha in everyone. Mm -hmm. And then he said, read my teacher's book. Trung wrote a book called, um, I can't remember that something, what is it? Uh, Cutting spiritual through spirit, materialism. Cutting, what is through, it? Cutting, cutting through, through spiritual, spiritual, materialism. spiritual materialism. So yeah. that was it. I think he had progressed from you know, I'm not the guy who's who can be your guru to, you know what, there's a little bit of the guru in everyone. Look for it. Nice. Yep. Yep. Good. Thank I'll you. I'll never forget those words. There's a yeah. If you look, if you look. So even those people who stormed the Capitol, yep. if you look. Yep. They're all they're all they're there's all there's a little in there. Okay. Yep. I went over, sorry. No, no problem. <laughs> yes, Kathy. Hi everybody. Happy Hi. New Year. Um, I just really wanted to say a couple of things to Freeman. Hi, I'm Kathy Cook, and I, I studied with Swami Satchidananda for several years um, when, and his disciples at the uh, 13th Street, um, I forget what they're called, ashram, in, uh, in New York City. I don't know if you're familiar with that. And yeah, that was an amazing the bookstore event. on the first floor. Yeah, it's still yeah. there. Right, but there. they also had monks there and uh, disciples and, well, they did. I think they still do. Also, Freeman, your background, is that the uh, Zen garden in uh, Kyoto? Yes, I, I think this is Daitoku, uh, I think it's Daitokuji. Okay, I recognized it. Yes, okay, thank yes. you. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> no, I, I did not, uh, that was after my time. Uh, Swamiji sent me up to Ananda Ashram where I lived and practiced under his direction. So I, I yeah. lost, I was lost that, touch with the, uh, the communities in the city. Was that in Connecticut? The one in Connecticut? No, 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 no. Uh, there was the one in uh, upstate New York. It's about an hour north of New York state. It was actually, uh, owned, Go ahead. What? Um, I was just saying it was just, it was really owned by the yoga society of New York. And he was, Kind of the the visiting guru kind of thing. Then they had the uh, big place Yogaville down south. Yes, yeah. yes. Yeah. A buddy of mine was at the Connecticut ashram, uh, but I, I never I, I lost touch with Swamiji somewhere in the nineteen seventy one. Okay, so 72. I was with him in the late seventies. Right. So okay, yeah, right. yeah. Okay, anyway. cool. Okay, let's. Yeah, uh, I actually traveled around India with him. Oh. Uh, in, in late 68. Wow. Okay. Yeah, on pilgrimage. 
Okay. But hi. Now we lost team. No, no, no. No, I was, I was. I was I was looking. We're get, we're going to move on to the poetry now. But but some of you might be interested from this conversation. I was looking for in my somewhere up here in, in the shelf. I have a book called uh, I think it's called A Blue Hand, and uh, the subtitle is something like The Beats in India. So it's hmm. about the times when when Ginsburg and some of the other beats were were traveling in India and. You know, there's always this idea that this is going to be the, you know, the fairy tale pilgrimage to enlightenment land. And there's always some of that. And there's always some, you know, if you've been to India or anywhere else, then there's the funky real stuff that you keep bumping into, which then always turns out to be the real enlightenment stuff. <laughs> you know, the, as, the last time uh, Yafa and I went to India, uh, and I think it was 2014, and um, one day on our itinerary, we were with a small group, and uh, one day on our itinerary, we had a, a three-hour bus ride from our hotel in, in Banaras, or Varanasi, to uh, uh, Agra to, to see so that we could... Uh, then stay the night in a hotel and see the Taj Mahal at dawn, which is the time I just to see. Have to, it was like six hours. It was supposed to be about six supposed hours. Supposed to be six hours? Okay. Yeah. I, I remember it was supposed to be about three, but so let's say four and a half, four point five. <laughs> and in any case, this turned out to be a 22 hour bus ride, um, partly because we blew not one but two tires on a Sunday. Uh, and we were out in nowhere, and mainly because it turned out that neither our driver nor his navigator could read English or Hindi or any other language. <laughs> so, so the uh, every time they saw you know a directional sign on the highway, they were they were just guessing. Uh, so we wound up with this. Uh, this 22 hour bus ride, at, including being stuck on the side of a highway in the middle of this rural area for, I don't know, at least three, four, five hours, uh, while our driver and, and, and his navigator said something to us, which we hope meant we'll be back before <laughs> hitching a ride on, on a motorcycle and eventually coming back in a donkey cart with a couple of spare tires. Meanwhile, we'd gone down the shoulder into the rice paddies. And we were a group, we were there mostly about mantra singing, kirtan singing. And we had, and I had my harmonium and someone else had a guitar and we just started singing. And soon all the locals were there <laughs> gathered around to see these crazy Westerners uh, singing their devotional music on the, the side of this highway. And uh, it was fantastic. It was, you know, it was probably the best part of the trip. So you never Great know. Great story. You never know. Mm -hmm. Anyway, um, so yeah, uh, we, we had this word beat here. Um, and most of you or many of you probably know that uh, Ginsburg and Jack Kerouac, or uh, the two, um, hold on one second. Sorry, I'm trying to get back to the correct window here. Uh, here we are. Um, I'm trying to share my screen. Here we go. Uh, so here's here's Allen Ginsberg and Jack Kerouac uh, in the in the fifties uh, when they were you know two the, probably the two foremost writers in the so-called beat movement this word beat which was coined for you know it meant beatific and it meant beat down uh, and um, you know later people making f fun of it and it being the fifties the era of Sputnik. Um, people parodying it coined the term beatnik, um, which you're probably familiar with. But this is where it started with with these guys, um, and um, you can see lots of um, 
uh, hear lots of audio and 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 hear and and see videos of of Ginsburg reading his poetry, which I recommend. You can find it online. The great watershed moment for the so-called Beat Generation was a poetry reading in San Francisco in the mid '50s, where Ginsburg read his huge epic poem Howl. Uh, which is sometimes referred to as the Beat Declaration of Independence. Um, and that's the one that starts, I saw the best minds of my generation starving, hysterical, naked, dragging themselves through the Negro streets at dawn looking for an angry fix. So that's so that as you as you can hear, that's largely the beat down side of of beat. Uh, largely about the suffering, the struggle in the middle of the whole kind of oppressive McCarthyist uh, Cold War 1950s in the shadow of the hydrogen bomb. Um, these guys, you know, looking for some kind of better way, looking for, for some sanity. Um, We're still looking. Still looking. So, uh, <laughs> so let's read some... Um, some Ginsburg. Okay, here's one of my very favorites. Um, for, first of all, I'm going to read in a moment, I'll sh and I'll share the screen with you, the Sunflower Sutra. Uh, most of you are aware a sutra in in the in Buddhist lingo, uh, a sutra is a is the record of a teaching by the Buddha. Mm. Um, um, which were set down supposedly were first after the Buddha died. He had an attendant who was also his cousin named Ananda, who supposedly had like perfect memory. So he was able to recite back all the teachings that the Buddha has get, had given for 45 years and they were, they were set down and, and passed down to us. And usually they'll be named for some um, metaphor, some symbol that, that is central to that particular teaching that the Buddha gave. Like, so it'll be the Flower Sutra, the Diamond Sutra, and so forth. So this is Ginsburg's Sunflower Sutra. Mm. Now the other, the other little piece of background, those of you who were with us back when we did um, William Blake many weeks ago, you know, his, his great, great poem, Ah, Sunflower, right? where the sunflower is the symbol of all the yearning, all the suffering, and all the yearning for, for, for illumination. Again, it's really the perfect beat symbol, the perfect symbol of being beat down and also opening to the, the beatific vision. Ah, sunflower, weary of time, who countest the steps of the sun, seeking after that sweet golden climb where the traveler's journey is done, where the youth pined away with desire, and the pale virgin shrouded in snow arise from their graves and aspire where my sunflower wishes to go. Now, Ginsburg, one day in the uh, mid or early 50s, was in, uh, in an apartment in Harlem, and uh, uh, he had a vision where he heard the voice of William Blake reciting that poem. And uh, and for several years, he went around and every wise person or holy man or woman or guru he could meet, he would tell them with great excitement about this vision and try to get them to explain to him what it meant, what, what it was all about. Um, eventually, he wised up enough to realize, just not to worry about that. Right, that it that it didn't matter, that it was what it was, and that what he should be paying attention to is, you know, the the essence, what that thing expressed. So here's the Sunflower Sutra. I'm going to share the screen, but I I really want to um, suggest that you 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 perhaps not be reading the text from the from the screen unless you. You really feel compelled to. It's you know his stuff is very incantatory. It's really I really want you to hear the music of this. Um, okay. <clears throat> uh, 
I walked on the banks of the tin can banana dock and sat down under the huge shade of a Southern Pacific locomotive to look at the sunset over the box house hills and cry. Jack Kerouac sat beside me on a busted, rusty iron pole. Companion, we thought the same thoughts of the soul, bleak and blue and sad-eyed, surrounded by the gnarled steel roots of trees of machinery. The oily water on the river mirrored the red sky. Sun sank on top of final Frisco peaks. No fish in that stream. No hermit in those mounts, just ourselves, roomy-eyed and hungover, like old bums on the river bank, tired and wily. Look at the sunflower, he said. There was a dead gray shadow against the sky, big as a man, sitting dry on top of a pile of ancient sawdust. I rushed up and chanted. It was my first sunflower, memories of Blake, my visions, Harlem, and hells of the eastern rivers, bridges clanking Joe's greasy sandwiches, dead baby carriages, black treadless tires forgotten and unretreaded, the poem of the riverbank, condoms and pots, steel knives, nothing stainless, only the dank muck and the razor-sharp artifacts passing into the past and the gray sunflower poised against the sunset, crackly, bleak, and dusty with the smut and smog and smoke of olden locomotives in its eye. Corolla of bleary spikes pushed down and broken like a battered crown, seeds fallen out of its face, soon to be toothless mouth of sunny air sun rays obliterated on its hairy head like a dried wire spider web leaves stuck out like arms out of the stem gestures from the sawdust root broke pieces of plaster fallen out of the black twigs a dead fly in its ear unholy battered old thing you were my sunflower oh my soul i loved you then the grime was no man's grime but death and human locomotives all that dress of dust that veil of darkened railroad skin that smog of cheek that eyelid of black misery that sooty hand or phallus or protuberance of artificial worse than dirt industrial modern all that civilization spotting your crazy golden crown and those blear thoughts of death and dusty loveless eyes and ends and withered roots below in the home pile of sand and sawdust rubber dollar bills skin of machinery the guts and innards of the weeping coughing car the empty lonely tin cans with their rusty tongues alack what more could i name the smoked ashes of some cock cigar the cunts of wheelbarrows and the milky breasts of cars worn out asses out of chairs and sphincters of dynamos all these entangled in your mummied roots and you there standing before me in the sunset all your glory in your form a perfect beauty of a sunflower a perfect excellent lovely sunflower existence a sweet natural eye to the new hip moon woke up alive and excited grasping in the sunset shadow sunrise golden monthly breeze how many flies buzzed round you innocent of your grime while you cursed the heavens of the railroad and your flower soul poor dead flower when did you forget you were a flower when did you look at your skin and decide you were an impotent dirty old locomotive the ghost of a locomotive the specter and shade of a once powerful mad american locomotive you were never no locomotive sunflower you were a sunflower and you locomotive you are a locomotive forget me not 
So I grabbed up the skeleton thick sunflower and stuck it at my side like a scepter and deliver my sermon to my soul and Jack's soul too and anyone who'll listen. We're not our skin of grime. We're not dread, bleak, dusty, imageless locomotives. We're golden sunflowers inside, blessed by our own seed and hairy, naked accomplishment bodies, growing into mad, black, formal sunflowers in the sunset, spied on by our own eyes under the shadow of the mad locomotive riverbank sunset frisky f sunset frisco hilly tin can evening sit down vision yeah <laughs> uh, wild <laughs> yes 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 indeed okay Talk to me. <laughs> Talk to me. What's this doing for you? What are you getting from this? By the way, I as I was reading this, I remembered I'd, for, I'd forgotten this. When I was in high school, a couple of years before I met Ginsburg in, in college up in San Francisco, I, I was in high school right here in, in L.A., and I had this record that came into my possession. It was red translucent vinyl the fantasy label an lp and it was of ginsburg reading his poetry Ooh. it was called howl and other poems it was called and this was on there and this poem i'm, I'm remembering now this poem was kind of one of the first really clear uh kind of shots i got of the of the of dharma insight you know such a clear explication of oh we're not our skin of grime. We're not all this external stuff. We're not a locomotive. We're not all this this stuff. This this you know, uh, you know sometimes ugly and awful and depressing stuff that we think we are. All the detritus of our lives. That we're this we're this golden sunflower inside. We're this we're this glorious, irreducible, pristine essence inside, and nothing nothing can change that. You know, I, I and I really kind of got that very clearly, maybe for the first time, um, uh, intellectually anyway, from from the poem. I'd gotten it experientially al already a couple of times, but to really get the clear insight of it. Mm. Other other th other thoughts about this poem. Mm. Wow. Well, for, uh, for me, can you hear me? Am I? Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, for me, uh, up until a certain point where he makes that switch in his in his view, yeah, uh, or shares that switch that occurred in his view, uh, my thought was, somebody shoot me now. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, and, and that's no accident, you know, that I think he, he, he's successfully portrayed that and his poetry has got a lot of, it really does. It's the, you know, I keep coming back to this word beat and the, and the two sides of it, the, the, the beat downness and, you know, his, you know, Ginsburg came from a difficult situation. His mother wound up in an insane asylum, um, uh, and, um, uh, um, uh, he did for a little while that's where he met his buddy carl solomon to whom the poem howl is dedicated and you know they went through a lot of drug stuff that was largely no fun um and uh um and and beyond the personal i think he's really trying to portray he's trying to give a vision of hell there you know the the where where they are by the side of the railroad in the you know among all this junk and just looking around at all this depressing junk and going like okay this is here's life at a certain uh level of living at a certain level of perception it's a bunch of old worn out you know cigars and wheelbarrows and 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 you know i'm sorry 
and this and this hit tomorrow or a few tomorrow in here is i someone... think somebody's talking on the phone oh okay okay oh. never mind Fine. yep what you said um so so uh so yeah he's he's kind of plunging us into into the hell realm there not just his own personal hell realm i think but the you know the hell realm of human life the hell realm of of uh of of american life at the in the in the middle of the of the cold war um i want to back up from that for a second and just say something about the form of it right those long long lines um and uh that may recall to you uh a poet we dealt with several weeks ago walt whitman mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. of course you know whitman was the pioneer of these long long lines um and uh um and G ginsburg felt a, some real poetic and spiritual closeness to whitman um and um and this idea and ideally the idea was that one line was that the real unit of poetry was not some mathematical you know cookie cutter thing like okay here's iambic pentameter 10 beats per line the, the with the with the emphasis on the on the even numbered beats you know that kind of thing um but that it was the human breath that poetry emerges from the human body and that and that a line should be a breath now to say those lines in one breath you need, <laughs> you, you need some, pre, some pretty super lungs i ca i can't do it um <laughs> I tr I tried on the last line and I ran out of breath there, <laughs> um, uh, but but kind of ideally in your in your mind anyway as you're reading the stuff um, I, you may find yourself connecting with it on a in an, in another way on another level by just kind of feeling each one of these as a big you know breath unit. It's a breath unit, a thought unit, a feeling unit, all of those things going together. Is that Whitman's concept or was that come across in the beat poetry? With... Um, it's, I don't think Whitman ever articulated it like that. Uh, it, it did get articulated. I'm trying to remember where I read that. That was years ago. I, I think it was Ginsburg or someone in Ginsburg's era. I think Ginsburg, not sure though. Yep. Um, but just the whole idea of poetry is something, you know, there's always a lot of physicality in Ginsburg's work and, and you know, and, and often kind of icky physicality. And you hear a lot of it in this poem, but he, but, he, and even when he's talking about the, 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 the spiritual essence within the, body underneath the all the locomotive grime it's you know the hairy naked accomplishment body as as he puts it um, um another reason that he connected with whitman was that they were both you know pioneers of of sexual identity they were both uh gay or 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 possibly gay plus and um uh, and in fact, at, at a certain point, and I think it comes out in that book I mentioned before, The Blue Hand, when uh, Ginsburg realized that he needed a guru, but he felt for a while that his guru needed to be gay, that, that otherwise the guru would not understand him. Um, uh, I think eventually he, he let, let go of that notion. That's an astonishing poem. And, yes. um, and also, I love the kind of mysterious serendipity of his, that vision he had of Blake reciting his sunflower poem. Yes. And then they're in that, they're in that scene, he, he and um, Kerouac, and Kerouac just sort of almost casually points to the sunflower. Yeah. From which just that pointing comes out this whole, you know, this, the whole shift happens through that. 
Um, yes. And who knows if Kerouac consciously even thought, like, oh, look, there's a sunflower. Look or at the sunflower. Kerouac, you know, right. tuned into the Blakeian reference or whatever. Right. Right. Yeah. And, you know, Bob, you're right. It, 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 there's shades of all those wonderful Zen mondo, those Zen stories there where there's something that triggers the illumination and it can be the homeliest thing. It can, you know, there's the stories of the, the one guy who's rowing across the misty lake and suddenly hears a crow cawing. And that's, and for that person at that moment, that's the ignition point that, and, and, and he experiences samadhi, it wakes him up. Okay. And, but of course, it's always for that person at that moment with whatever was going on with, you know, to, to, there's a tendency to read stories like that and go, okay, I got to go find that lake. I got to go find that crow <laughs> and, and, and listen to it caw and that'll enlighten me. I had this, I had that experience once, um, it was, uh, some of you have, have also studied with our wonderful Buddhist teacher uh, from Switzerland, Charles Genoux. And um, I was at a, at a teaching of Charles's up in, um, I think this is when we were meeting at um, the Garrison Institute. And um, he, would, he, he would bring all these funny, um, very simple um, physical aspects, physical moving into, into the teaching. So we all came in for a meditation. And you know, when and we were a couple of weeks into the retreat, and there's a tendency to, you know, everyone gets very settled in their um, and there, you know, it's like you build your little fort. You know, you've got, okay, there's your cushion, or maybe your two cushions or your little bench for your knees, just the way you like it. And, and maybe there's your little water bottle or your notebook or all that. And you feel, okay, now I'm, that's, that's my home base. And, and you, you wind up there for the whole retreat. So, so this particular session, everyone came in, everyone got nice and settled into their fort. And then the very first thing that Charles did was he made us all stand up and start walking around and you know get us out of our little forts. And and I can't remember specifically the things he had us do. Um, knowing Charles, they were very simple. And somehow we all wound up in a different place. We all wound up out of our comfort zone, out of our fort. I wound up on someone else's green cushion and it, and of course, what it short circuited was all our things of, okay, now I'm sitting down to meditate and all our preconceived notions, all our, you know, our, our, our assumptions, the, the, the little subtle adjustments that we don't even realize we're making them because they're so subtle that, okay, this is what happens or what's supposed to happen when you meditate. He just, in his very quiet, skillful way, G g flipped us out of all of that and I wound up in some other part of the room sitting on someone else's cushion I remember it was a bright green cushion and and never told us to meditate we just wound up being <laughs> right wherever we were and of course it was the most profound non-meditation meditation I had in the whole month on the retreat and then I found myself going Okay, I got to figure out how to keep getting back to this green cushion. <laughs> right? And 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 in a way that is that is the history of religion in a nutshell right there. Right? Someone gets flipped out of his usual um um habitual ways of seeing and thinking and feeling and being winds up in some other place, winds up you know, sitting in a tomato patch and because they've gotten knocked out of their comfort zone and wind up just with the, you know, the childlike original mind, the mind just, just spontaneously open and fresh, um, they experience the essence, they experience the beingness and then they go, wow. And then, you know, it's great. And then, you know, 2000 years later, everyone is selling tickets to the tomato patch and 
<laughs> making <laughs> pilgrimages to the tomato patch and you know wearing sacred tomato medallions around their necks and and so forth um which is also great in its way <laughs> you know it's also if they be, it, it becomes a reminder a reminder to 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 connect um uh but of course then the danger if, of it the the is is that we wind up with nothing but the tchotchkes you know nothing but the 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 holy tomato <laughs> medallions and and we lose the experience that that it was all about to begin with all finger no moon all finger no moon right and and of course the more we dress up the finger pointing at the moon, the fancier costumes we put on it, the fancier rings and all that, the easier it is to get distracted by that and just more and more to to fetishize the the more we fetishize the finger, the 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 more the danger of forgetting to follow its trajectory and look up at the moon. Well, you know, it seems like going back to the poem, Ginsburg subverted any chance of doing that. Nobody's going to want to go down that filthy river bank. <laughs> right. And right. You know, even the sunflower is kind of decrepit. But I mean, that's the power of that poem. Like, you know, you talked about the crow that woke up the boatsman. Right. That, but it's not going to work for us. But the right. beauty of that poem is it's a transmission to hear it. I mean, he's taking it as metaphor and then as, you know, a metaphor that's alive in us. Yes, um, because it's so yes. beautiful, and he's going into the darkest, most dismal setting that we could imagine. You have we to, can... you have to find it in the darkest, most dismal place for it right. to be significant. It's like you know when the, when the, when the disciple asks the 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 Roshi, "What is the Buddha?" <laughs> and he says, "Oh, the Buddha is a pile of cow shit in the middle of the road." Right? If you can see the Buddha, if you can see God in the cow shit, you can see it everywhere. And no one's gonna, no one's gonna fetishize cow shit. No one's gonna wear a lump of cow shit, you know, on a, on a, as a medallion around their neck. So yeah, absolutely. A great poem. Yeah, it really is. You know, and I just as you were saying that, Bob. Also, I realized, you know, there's a story about um, in Christian tradition of Jesus. Uh, what's the term they use? Harrowing hell. Oh right. Right, where Jesus going down into the depths of hell to to redeem the lost soul, something like that, uh, and you know that's an archetypal thing of the the hero, the shining hero going into the underworld. We've got that in the in the in the um, uh, the uh, the Jataka tales, um, which are the tales of the Buddha before he was the Buddha, the, supposedly the Buddha in his earlier incarnations, his earlier lives. Before, and, and in one of them, he's down in the hell realms and he's an ox. <laughs> he's an ox down in the, the deepest hell realms, pulling a cart full of the, the damned, you know, the, the, the damned souls. But because he's the, the future Buddha, he pulls that cart with such love and compassion that it's setting all those souls on the the pathway to eventual mm. illumination. So, so Please. yeah. Um, yeah, Lulu? I, what I got from the poem is, it was beautiful. It's the first time I, I hear it. Mm -hmm. um, he must have had a glimpse of um, consciousness because he talks about life being messy and he's talking about our perception of life as is, is unbearable. Mm -hmm. um, but if we can reach to our depth and know ourselves in such a way that we are all one, and we're all connected, then we can rise up like the sunflower and shine as one. Yep, that's the, that's the, that's the stuff. That's the good stuff. It's, it's all about that illumination, absolutely. Right. Yep. It's no accident that it's a sunflower too. You know, Sun, I mean, it's, uh, it's, 
I'm sorry, say that again, Bob. I, it's no accident that it's a sunflower. I mean, obviously, Blake, sunflower. Yeah. But yeah. the sun shining for that just. Sort yeah, of yeah. It. You know, when when we when we uh, did Blake many weeks ago, I, I mentioned in in to in my my sense of it is that when when blake uses the sunflower as as the symbol there's there's two reasons one is kind of two levels to it you know the first line ah sunflower weary of time who countest the steps of the sun what that's about is the fact that the sunflower is heliotropic it it in the morning it faces the east and as the as the sun moves across the sky the sunflower follows it Right. So there's the sunflower as the symbol of the individual soul, the Atman, mm -hmm. right, in, in Hindu lingo, f yearning, yearning for the infinite, that which is beyond time. Who, mm -hmm. Ah, sunflower, weary of time. Oh my God, don't we get weary of time? Don't we get all this? Ay, Vesmir, as my mother would say, all the all the schlepping through time and space and objects and events and cause and effect. And now it's time to brush your teeth and now it's time to eat something and now it's time to poop again. And now it's time to meet some people and say something, you know, there's 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 of course, there's there's a level of all of it that's delightful, but there's also a level of it is of, oh my God, how many iterations of this fucking movie do we have to go through, right? And 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 a wearying of that um, until it's redeemed by the eternal, until it's redeemed by that which is beyond all the work of, of, of going through time. And and that for me, that whole thing is there in that first line. and And, the, you know, the genius of Blake is that it's all there and it's so simple. Ah, sunflower, weary of time, who countest the steps of the sun. Two lines, two lines. Seeking after that sweet golden climb, meaning climate zone area, that sweet golden climb where the traveler's journey is done. Right? So there's the two things. The one th level of it is that the sunflower is heliotropic. But the other is that it looks like the sun. So all this time that it's yearning for that thing, all the time that the Atman is yearning for Brahman, all the time, actually, the Atman is Brahman. <laughs> actually, the, the yeah. individual soul, you know, actually, that thou art, right? <laughs> actually, tag your it. Actually, uh, the 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 God that you are looking for, the light that you are seeking, is the one that's seeking it. Right, and of course that's ex also exactly the the message of of, of the Ginsburg poem. Um, sh should I read it one more time before we close to, to kind oh, of please. put it put it back together? Okie doke. Yeah. I'll do that, and then we'll then we'll get out of here. Okay. <clears throat> I walked on the and and try and by the way, just a reminder, see if you can feel each of these lines as a as a breath unit, even if it's a superhuman breath unit that I'm not capable of. The Sunflower Sutra. I walked on the banks of the tin can banana dock and sat down under the huge shade of a Southern Pacific locomotive to look at the sunset over the box house hills and cry. Jack Kerouac sat beside me on a busted rusty iron pole. Companion, we thought the same thoughts of the soul bleak and blue and sad-eyed, surrounded by the gnarled steel roots of trees of machinery. The oily water on the river mirrored the red sky. Sun sank on top of final Frisco peaks. No fish in that stream, no hermit in those mounts, just ourselves, roomy-eyed and hungover, like old bums on the river bank, tired and wily. 
Look at the sunflower, he said. There was a dead gray shadow against the sky, big as a man, sitting dry on top of a pile of ancient sawdust. I rushed up and chanted. It was my first sunflower. Memories of Blake, my visions, Harlem, and hells of the eastern rivers, bridges clanking Joe's greasy sandwiches, dead baby carriages, black treadless tires forgotten and unretreaded, the poem of the river bank, condoms and pots, steel knives, nothing stainless, only the dank muck and the razor sharp artifacts passing into the past. And the gray sunflower, poised against the sunset, crackly, bleak, and dusty, with the smut and smog and smoke of olden locomotives in its eye. Corolla of bleary spikes pushed down and broken like a battered crown, seeds fallen out of its face, soon to be toothless mouth of sunny air, sun rays obliterated on its hairy head like a dried wire spider web leaves stuck out like arms out of the stem gestures from the sawdust root broke pieces of plaster fallen out of the black twigs a dead fly in its ear unholy battered old thing you were my sunflower oh my soul i loved you then <clears throat> the grime was no man's grime but death and human locomotives all that dress of dust that veil of darkened railroad skin that smog of cheek that eyelid of black misery that sooty hand or phallus or protuberance of artificial worse than dirt industrial modern all that civilization spotting your crazy golden crown and those blear thoughts of death and dusty loveless eyes and ends and withered roots below in the home pile of sand and sawdust rubber dollar bills skin of machinery the guts and innards of the weeping coughing car the empty lonely tin cans with their rusty tongues alack what more could i name the smoked ashes of some cock cigar, the cunts of wheelbarrows and the milky breasts of cars, worn out asses out of chairs and sphincters of dynamos, all these entangled in your mummied roots. And you there, standing before me in the sunset, all your glory in your form, a perfect beauty of a sunflower, a perfect, excellent, lovely sunflower existence a sweet natural eye to the new hip moon woke up alive and excited grasping in the sunset shadow sunrise golden monthly breeze how many flies buzzed round you innocent of your grime while you cursed the heavens of the railroad and your flower soul poor dead flower when did you forget you were a flower when did you look at your skin and decide you were an impotent dirty old locomotive the ghost of a locomotive the specter and shade of a once powerful mad american locomotive you were never no locomotive sunflower you were a sunflower and you locomotive you are a locomotive forget me not so i grabbed up the skeleton thick sunflower and stuck it at my side like a scepter and deliver my sermon to my soul and jack's soul too and anyone who'll listen we're not our skin of grime we're not dread bleak dusty imageless locomotives we're golden sunflowers inside blessed by our own seed and hairy naked accomplishment bodies growing into mad black formal sunflowers in the sunset spied on by our own eyes under the shadow of the mad locomotive riverbank sunset frisco hilly tin can evening sit down vision
Okay, then. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, brother. Thank you. Yeah, thank thank you. you. So may all beings swiftly see through their their skin of locomotive grime and realize their pure, pristine, inviolable, eternal, blissful sunflower selves. <laughs> Please. Thank you. Enjoy. Thank you very much. Enjoy being. Thank you. Thank you.